Okay. So um, just to introduce myself very quickly, um, my name is Neil Stobart. I'm uh, with Cloudian today. I've only been there for three, three or four weeks, so please be gentle. Um, you know, I, I've spent uh, quite a bit of time in the storage industry. Uh, I was at Nexenter previous to Cloudian. For that, I was at Dell, and I was at uh, I joined Dell through the acquisition of Compellent. For that, I was at Hitachi Data Systems, um, and worked a lot in the storage virtualization field um, over the years. Um, and I really think that the, and I'm going to start to use some, some words like cloud and object storage, you know, and I'll, I'm going to treat them as a, the sort of the buzzwords um, that everyone looks at them. But I think there's going to be a lot of focus moving forward around how we're managing, you know, unstructured data through the use of object and, and through kind of accessing that data through, through cloud um, access capabilities. So, Really, I want to go back to something that Chris mentioned um, right at the start of the day. Um, you, you, know, you know, there's an evolution, a revolution, I'm never, never sure which one, going on in the industry right now. Um, and a lot of it's driven by the advent of flash storage. Because, you know, up until just a couple of years ago, we were looking at, you know, the 15K, 10K drive technology to deliver that high performance uh, that we needed for our critical applications, for the applications that needed high transactional you know, workload. Flash has kind of blown that, that market wide open. And, and I was at a, you know, a large, large uh, banking organization uh, a couple of years ago, and, and I kind of asked them what their storage strategy was. And very flippantly, they said it was flash and trash. So I thought that was, you know, and they were kind of being rude. They didn't want me to be there anyway, and, you know, they kind of wanted me out. But, but I kind of took that, and actually I thought that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, so I think what you're going to be seeing is that, you know, those applications that need high transactional capability are, are absolutely moving up into the, the flash storage. But actually the bulk of data, you know, you know, which is the vast majority, you know, the larger proportion of data that you have in your data center, is going to be sitting, you know, could be class classified as the trash. Now, you know, I don't like the word trash because it insinuates little value. And I think, um, you know, but I was kind of, you know, I got what they were getting, getting at. You know, this is absolutely, it's almost like a two-tier approach now. And, and what's happening is, you know, the flash, um, you know, solutions are giving you, um, you know, that the high transactional capability, the high performance requirement for actually a relatively small subset. So you can almost divide it between, you know, structured data, unstructured data. But, you know, all of the growth and all the analysts and all the vendors will tell you all of the growth and actual capacity is going on here. So, so what we've got to try and do is to start to look at storage in, in a bit more of a, and nobody likes the word, but siloed approach. We're almost going back to direct attached storage. But when I talk about direct attached storage, what I actually mean is workload attached storage. So obviously you're going to have platforms. I mean, you know, you could buy a, a solid, solid fire array here and you could run, you know, SQL Server and Oracle and Exchange and your VMware uh, platform, um, all of those uh, workloads that, that need high I.O. But actually then you start to look at, you know, your file systems, your, uh, your machine, machine data that gets created, the stuff, that, the data that needs to be sucked up into big data analytics type analysis, you know, that's where the, you know, the media, uh, you know, audio, you know, video, that, that's, that's really where the growth is. So, so we're starting to look at two different approaches. And actually, the technology that's getting squeezed is that standard storage array technology, you know, that we're, we all know, love, or slash hate, um, you know, in the middle here. So we're starting to see this sort of divergence. And, and like I say, you know, I think we're going back to where we need to start to build um, storage and, and compute platforms based on workload. You know, I think there's a place for hyper-converged, I think there's a place for flash, and I think there's a place for, you know, scale-out, um, web scale-out storage as well. So there's a very def definite um, split between the two. And, you know, from a Cloudian, you know, we do not go after, you know, the transactional databases. That's not what we're about. We let, um, you know, those vendors that focus on that type of solution. We're about dealing with, you know, the, the larger data set, the unstructured data, 
you know, where, where all that data growth is. And what we're trying to do is to differentiate between your know, standard data storage and smart data storage. So object storage is all about you know, having data about the data. It's about having metadata that describes the data so that we can manage it cleverly, we can reference it, we can um, actually treat it like information rather than just a you know, data blob, whether that's a block, it's a file, or you know, whatever. So because we, you know, information is kind of the lifeblood of most organizations and that what separates two different companies that are in the same industry, you know, it's, it's the data about their customers, the data about their products, and this is where, you know, we start to want to use big data analytics type techniques to, to bring different data sets together so that we can get more value out of our data. So, you know, using object store, um, you know, aligned with the likes of big data analytics solutions, you know, we can turn that information into something valuable. So at Cloudian, we've, we've produced um, a product called Hyperstore. And really, it's kind of three things that we're, we're taking to market about that. Um, one is cost efficiency. So when you look at, you know, I, I mentioned earlier on, the, the value that, you know, Amazon are bringing to the market with their cloud, public cloud storage solutions, it's about cost. They're talking about, you know, one cent for a gigabyte of storage per month. So, you know, if we want to compete in that space, then we've got to start to look at, you know, similar economics for storage. So we're kind of getting there. We're getting there because, and I want to use the phrase software-defined storage and, you know, start getting things thrown at me because that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And, and I've just come from the company that's the self-proclaimed leader in software-defined storage. Yeah, yeah. Some, some shout it louder than others. Um, but it's about using commodity hardware. You know, that, that's very important in, in this space about trying to drive down uh, the cost of storage. Uh, and actually, it's about the efficiency of how you store data. I mean, that's actually more important. So the likes, you know, using the technology likes of uh, compression and deduplication, how you do your data protection, how many copies you need, or, you know, can you do RIDs, five, six, erasure coding, that, that kind of thing. So it's about efficiency of the storage. Um, so the two things really is what's driving, you know, cost efficiency. Um, and there's been a great discussion about hybrid cloud. Um, we believe we've got the best solution that can kind of marry the two, where you can have on-premise uh, solution that can also burst out or give you a lower cost footprint out in the public cloud as well. And then, you know, the smart data piece that I was just uh, referring to on the, on the last slide, making better use, turning data into information and, and actually driving value out of that information. So, you know, I really toyed with taking this slide out. If I didn't have this slide, then the next four don't make any sense. So, you know, it's your data, your cloud, your way. That's the dance that they taught me. So, um, your data at web scale economics. So, it's all about leveraging industry standard hardware. Um, and then, and I say industry standard, commodity, it's x86 servers, you know, really the, the cheapest or best value, you know, not to say cheap anymore, best value hardware um, out on the market. Um, and what's nice is that, you know, we can sort of look at, you know, I might have 10 drives in this one, 10 drives in this one, but actually a new footprint comes out from one of the hard, you know, the server manufacturers that do, you know, 90 drives in, in a 2U footprint. You want to take advantage of that because it's best, you know, best cost per footprint per, per hardware, per gigabyte. Well, you want to now adopt that. So, you know, we talked... Hans was talking about, you know, becoming dissatisfied, you know, as time goes on because you can maybe can't leverage some of the new uh, innovations in hardware. Well, the way that we kind of stagger data across multiple nodes, actually you can take advantage of uh, different size nodes in here. So, um, you know, taking advantage of commodity servers, we've got a very much a scale out approach. Um, you know, it's, you know, marketing are telling us that, you know, we can scale out to a thousand, you know, thousands of nodes, multi petabytes. Um, you know, we quite haven't got a customer that uh, is doing thousands of nodes yet. But we're actually, um, in Amazon's data center, we've got a 200 node cluster. Um, you know, we haven't kind of broken any of the, the limits on it yet, so it's all looking uh, pretty good at this stage. So durable, you know, data protection, uh, you know, availability, reliability, making sure the data is spread across different nodes, different data centers, different regions. You know, very important to running, you know, mission critical um, applications or data. Um, and then it's, it's going to be simple to use. And, I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go through the, the GUI. Um, but, you know, one of the key things, again, that Hans mentioned about hyper-converged solutions, what's nice about the deployment is it's wizard-driven to, to, you know, to deploy a quite a complicated infrastructure. So 
we, we've actually got something similar. We've got a wizard-driven deployment tool so that you, know, you just set it up on one node and it just rolls out the whole um, cluster. And then when you add in, want to add in additional nodes or remove nodes in the future, um, you, know, you just go to the same wizard and that can then just pull out and, and you know, kind of balance the data across the, uh, the remaining nodes or the, the new nodes that are coming in. Um, right, the hybrid flexibility piece. So we have made a rather large bet on S3 compatibility. So the only way to get data in or out of our platform is to use S3 or the S3 API. And because we've made this big bet, we're absolutely in lockstep with Amazon as they develop, develop their S3 API and bring new features. We're absolutely committed to make sure that we are the cl as close to Amazon as possible. I'd love to say 100%, and the marketing guys will tell you they're 100% compatible with, with, with the S3. 110%. Because we do some extra, extra stuff as well. We are an error level, error level compatible as well. But you can never be 100% with, uh, with whoever's developing that, that code, right? Because they're going to release something, then you get it, and then you kind of hurry up and develop that. But, you know, we will always be uh, as close to lockstep with Amazon and development of S3 as possible. Now, that's really important because a lot of the other vendors are implementing S3 as a gateway. We've actually got our S3 servers directly in, in our nodes, in, our in, in each, each, uh, each of our distributed nodes. So why have we gone S3? Well, we kind of think this is the de facto standard for, for accessing you know, cloud, cloud storage these days. And why am I saying, I'm, I'm kind of making that claim, but you know, there's four to 500 independent software vendors that now support writing data out into S3. And in fact, I spoke to a customer last week who've developed their, you know, their own in-house app and have written it to S3. Unfortunately, they're developing a financial application, then they got told that they can't use AWS because it's financial information and they need to keep it in premise. So then they were kind of panicking because they'd written this application for S3, uh, but couldn't write it out to AWS. So uh, we were like, oh, we can, we can help you there. So S3, really important. Uh, and we do think that you know, as time goes by, more and more uh, ISPs are going to um, support S3. So our friend Zerto, they, they can write into an S3. Um, you know, Cloud Bucket, uh, Solid Fire, you know, they can be the flash and then we can store their uh, snapshots and backups through S3 connectivity. Symantec, for example, uh, Net Backup, you know, can, can write to S3 storage, but they actually use our platform to develop their S3 compliance, um, you know, when, when they're testing and bringing out their, their products that support that. So, not only do we accept S3 coming into us, we can also push data out into S3. So that could be, you know, S3 from, from Amazon, or it could be Glacier, or it could be another Cloudium platform, or it could even be any other S3-enabled application. So straight away, we've got some tiering um, built into this. And what's nice is that this gives um, an organization uh, an approach where they can adopt a cloud computing platform, cloud storage platform, uh, but they're not being locked into having to have everything in their own data center. So they can store some things locally and they can push some, some of the things, maybe you know, some of that data that um, you know, isn't, isn't accessed so much, if you like, in, into the, sort of the, the, the cheaper, cheaper storage. And actually, one of the things that we're seeing or, or thinking about is that actually cloud storage, public cloud storage, in the future will be, will be free. Yes, yes. How are you keeping consistency between object IDs when you push it out into something like Amazon compared to the object IDs you might generate on your own <coughs> environment? So we still keep a track of the metadata in our database referencing the actual object that's been so you, pushed out. So you would push that object out? And we're still providing the... It's like a stub in, in, in simplistic terms. Um, so, so, so what you've got is, and you know, so like I say, you know, how can you compete with free? Well, actually, what we're then just giving you is the option to, um, you know, use free storage at the back end as you sort of scale up when that data becomes uh, more static. Um, what's really important for you know something like a scale-out storage platform, uh, especially if you're offering storage services across multiple users, groups, applications. Um, is very much about the multi-tenancy and you know quality of service. So we need to make sure that you know what 
tenant A, user A is doing does not impact user B, user C, and we make sure that you know, everyone gets, gets their defined you know, SLA, so capacity and performance in particular we're looking at. And then we want to also support multi-region. So the whole purpose, um, you know, or you know, one of the advantages of running a scale-out architecture is that we can distribute the hardware and the data across you know, multiple data centers, countries, regions, however you want to carve it up. But you know, we've already talked today some about uh, you know, security, about maybe you know, a customer, a tenant you know, has to keep their data in the UK, another tenant and, or a different data set, that might be fine to have a copy in the US because it's cheaper over here or for whatever reason. But you also may have users distributed across the globe as well. So it makes sense to have you know, data locality. So if we've got data replicated across a region, uh, across the globe like this, a user over here, if he can access his data locally and avoid coming across the Atlantic to pick up his data, then obviously there's a good performance impact there as well as your data protection uh, replication capability as well. So you can set a policy at the, the bucket level, and the bucket really is the logical virtualization of our storage platform and obviously this is part of the S3 API so where you you can you can create a bucket you can give that to a user you can give that to a group of users or an application however you know you need to divvy the storage up um, and at the bucket level you know you've got role-based access and um, clearly you need security credentials for each user each um, user group to be able to access and manage their, their data Quality of service is set at the bucket level, so we can set limits on how much capacity, how much uh, you know, either IOPS or throughput that that um, user is going to have. Um, clearly, you need the monitoring piece to, to uh, you know, tell the user what he's using, what he's not using, how the, the whole system as a whole is operating. And then you know, we've talked about encryption as well, and we can offer encryption either at the bucket level or at the individual object level. And that gets encrypted as it comes, you know, as, as the data, as the data object comes into the Cloudium platform, it's encrypted before it gets put down on the disks. If we then tiered it out to S3, for example, Amazon S3, it's still encrypted. And then actually, you know, we were talking earlier, you know, if the NSA wants to snoop on that data, they've actually got to come back to the customer to get the key to access the data rather than Amazon just giving that away uh, without the customer knowledge. So I'm going to go. Um, what's what's uh, you know actually the technology that's inside? That's all been a little bit of a marketing marketing fluff at the moment. So this is um, and actually this is a completely redesigned diagram thanks to Chris because we were calling it the Cloudian Ring, and Chris kind of uh, handily mentioned to our um, chief engineer that actually it was more of a mesh. So all of a sudden we've got a more, much more complicated uh, diagram there. So so basically you know we add. Um, server nodes, server, physical server hardware nodes, and then we you know, use our software that sits on top of each node. And we're using um, some open source technology called Cassandra to be able to offer a true peer-to-peer -peer architecture. And you know, what, what's, what's unique about that is that not only are we storing data distributed across all of the nodes, but the metadata is also <coughs> distributed evenly across the nodes as well. So a lot of object store platforms actually have you know, one or two servers where the metadata is handled, and that can become a bottleneck in this type of architecture. Now, the physical nodes can then be defined to be whether they're in a rack or a data center or in a region. So then you can decide where you want copies of your data to go according to the location of that physical node. So, for example, here we've got DC1, DC2, and I might say I want a policy where I want a copy here and a copy there. Or I might just want to copy locally in my DC1 here and here. As we spread the data across all of those nodes, you know, we try to make a, a balance. And we have um, Cassandra has um, something called vNode. And vNode, and this is, this is also how we can support um, different size um, storage nodes in the cluster as well. So vNode is almost taking the storage in an individual node and breaking it down into smaller segments. So I've got 90 drives in here and 10 drives here. I'm going to have more V nodes here because I'm, I want to put more storage on this particular node because I have more resources to use. So this is the, uh, the concept of the, um, you know, the geographical diversification of the, the physical nodes. So here we just have one region, one data center, 
Uh, and in this example, we're going to have a repeat factor of three. So I'm going to make three copies, and I'm going to have a copy of my data on three different nodes. So if I lose that node, I've still got two copies here. If I lose two nodes, I've still got a copy here. I can have a repeat factor of four, five, six, you know, however you want to take it. But every time I make another copy of my data, it's more, you know, raw storage overhead. So if I'm doing a repeat factor of three, I'm actually consuming 300% um, of my storage. So I've basically got 300%, um, you know, uh, data overhead, usable versus raw. Here we've got a single ring that's spread across two data centers, but still in one region. So that is considered to be one ring. So now I can decide that my repeat factor, if it's three, well, in this case, it's five, right? So I'm going to have three copies locally and two copies here. And I can decide, actually, at the bucket level, whether I want to do this or, you know, because this could be in another country, I might decide for a particular bucket, I want just three copies here locally. Another bucket, I can do this and have it in di different data centers. So we can kind of start to adhere to, you know, the security and, and regulation uh, policies. Five minutes. And then region, and um, this is where you actually have two completely independent rings, but a user, it's still managed within the same system, a user can still see two different buckets. So a bucket here and a bucket here. And this might be where you want absolute separation based on geography. Um, so this is kind of the life cycle of how we do um, an S3 put. So just to give you an example, um, an S3 uh, request is coming in from the client, and basically the coordinate coordinator node, so the first node that responds back to that request um, says, right, okay, what, this is your policy for your particular bucket. We're going to have, you know, two copies locally, one copy uh, in DC2. So Cassandra computes this V node. It determines which set of nodes it's going to use to put that data down. Um, and then in parallel, the request is sent to all the, the other data nodes that have been identified as being recipients of that particular data object. Uh, at each data node, the data is then written to the disk and once the data has been written to the disk, it wants to send back to the coordinator who sends the ACK back to the, uh, to the client. So clearly, if this is DC2 is in the US and these two are in the UK, for example, that ACK coming back is going to be subject to latency of the network. So we do have different consistency levels. And this determines, you know, at what point do we want to say that that transaction has been committed? So we're kind of somewhere between, you know, doing it synchronous replication and asynchronous replication. So what we can do closer to synchronous replication is say, you know, we want to be able to, you know, say, commit once it's written to all the local nodes. And then, you know, in the background, you know, we'll acknowledge to the application to the client and then the background send across our third copy, if you like, to the, to the remote data center. So we can actually vary this kind of, you know, how, however which way is needed. Um, and this, again, is all configurable at the user at the bucket level. So we can either have, you know, complete um, synchronous replication, if you like, across data centers, um, you know, across the wire, if performance is not an issue. If performance is an issue, then you probably want to do your acknowledgement once it's been written to the designated number of nodes in the local data center. Uh, now, I've really got to power on through here. Two minutes left. Uh, two ways of, um, of protecting data. So the repeat factor is just literally, it's like mirroring. It's just, you know, repeating the copies of data across different nodes. And then erasure encoding, which is a little bit more like RAID 5, RAID 6 implementation, but spreading it across nodes rather than just disks within a particular system. So really, um, you know, the advantages of using erasure encoding is you, bet you get a better efficiency of your raw storage consumption than you do if you're making um, just complete copies. So in this example, we're doing a four plus two, two parity disks. So you get, um, I should know this number, but let's say 70, 80%, um, you know, 20, 30% overhead um, compared to doing multiple copies, you know, which might be 300%. The downside is, and as Hans said, you don't get anything for nothing. There's more calculation has to go on. So it's like if you're writing to RAID 5, you've got to cal calculate the parity bit set. You know, whereas if you're just mirroring, you're just spreading that data down in two locations, so better write performance. So there's a bit of a trade-off on performance and CPU overhead, but you get better, <laughs> better usable capacity. Um, just some other, other bits that's configurable at the bucket level. Object size. If we've got a small object, less than 50K, it actually might make more sense for us to store it in the metadata database than actually put it in the file system. Because typically we'll put the metadata database on SSD so we can get better response. And the actual size of a metadata 
is about the size, same size as 50K. So you know, we can actually get better performance and actually you know, be a lot more efficient in how we store that smaller, smaller data block. We can also deal with very large objects as well. So we support multi-part upload and actually as it comes down into the platform we start to break it up into smaller chunks and then distribute it across the nodes and as that object gets recalled by S3 we'll, we'll bring it all back together again and um, send it up as appropriate. Uh, quality of service I've talked about already. Um, are these slides being made available later on? Yep, okay, so you, have the, you can look at these in a little bit more detail but we can at the bucket level define uh, quality of service limits. And just as an example, um, we have a customer NTT in Tokyo. They have 2.3 individual, sorry, 2.3 million individual users using their single hyperstore platform. So it just shows, in terms of you know user skill, we're doing that. And then um, Nifty, they've got three and a half thousand um, enterprise customers, um, you know, supporting again on a single uh, hyperstore installation. So just some of, the, some of the other features, I'm going to skip past. Now we do do it software defined. So you can buy the software and run it on any hardware. We also can package it up into uh, an appliance because you know, my experience is that there will be some customers that want to do it this way. So they're, they're all in support, turnkey solution, or you know, they might want to deploy it um, and choose their own hardware. Um, also very important, use cases. Like I said, right at the outset, we're not going after that high transactional database workload. But, you know, anywhere where there's a large amount of data, um, you know, large data, um, objects, files, blocks, you know, that's where this type of solution is very much aimed at. It's aimed at that kind of unstructured data. So large backups, archives, media content store, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Done. Any questions? Am I able to deploy, like, uh, computation stuff? Like, do mad compute algorithms? my own kind of algorithms and just deploy it in your in, in the cloud there yeah. and your engines to analyze the data so easy, easy answer is yes okay so we're running standard Linux uh, Red Hat or CentOS um, we run in the user space not the not the root space so we are just an application running if you want to install another application on that box then you can the s3 is a single namespace so the application that's on that namespace, it can just go out to the DNS and uh, DNS server and pick up the, uh, the actual you know, namespace, and then it will still operate in the same way where it will spread its data across. But we're actually in collaboration with Hortonworks um, on their Hadoop implementation um, to, to, to do exactly that kind of um, space. Yeah, yeah. Was there a question at the back? OK. <laughs> Because the other thing is, is also how do you deploy this? Because we can deploy it in a, in a VSA, so we can run in a virtual machine environment, and also we're working on do, uh, container deployment as well. So initially, the container would just be the, the whole thing packaged up, but we're also looking at breaking out the different services within our stack. Because you know, we've got the S3 server, we've got Cassandra, we've got some other bits and pieces that we've you know, bring, bring into their own containers and then, you know, divvy up as, as appropriate. So we've got a lot, lot, lot of flexibility moving forward.